Good evening. There are four things that I would like to share with you about Roger Duffy, beyond what you already know about his illustrious career as partner at Skidmore Owings in Maryland, New York, as designer of such excellent buildings as the Burr Street Elementary School and the Skyscraper Museum, as winner of major design awards, and as one of the key players in the American architectural scene today. Firstly, he is a very nice guy. He's very engaging, modest, and warm. You're, you're about to see that. Secondly, he attracts the best GSD students to work in his studio at SOM. He also attracts my best employees. Over the past years, I've learned that when one of my good designers in the office asks me to see me in private, it's often in order to tell me that they are moving to New York and to work with Roger Duffy. They would kindly justify their move by saying that they are attracted by the lure of the big city. But over the years, I've also come to accept that Roger Duffy has more than New York going for him. So if you're good, watch out. You might end up in his studio. Thirdly, he has created unusual venues for architecture to thrive. Within the context of SOM, where he has been partner since 1997, he has managed to elevate the discourse on design and accordingly its quality by initiating the unusual and unusually good SOM journal, which is a yearly journal that invites a jury from outside the firm to select projects that get published in the journal. Within SOM, he has also created venues from the firm to draw in types of projects that do not usually come into large firms. And I'm referring to the highly successful education lab that has been the brewing ground for such projects as PS62, and that has become a model for other firms to follow. Fourthly, Roger has enlarged the table of the designers at SOM and has brought in engineers, artists, and scientists to sit around this table. And along the way, he has also revised the tools and methods of architecture, reinforcing what he refers to as the iterative dimension of design and setting in benchmarking strategies and elevating performative criteria. These are tools and methods that we also hold very high here at the GSD in our education of our students. So in many ways, Roger, we would like to think of this as an exchange program. And so for all of the above, I would also, I would also like to ask you please to join me in welcoming back to the GSD, Roger Duffy. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much for that very thoughtful introduction. Very human, very thoughtful. <clears throat> there are many different things that you can do with your career, so I'd like to just talk to you directly as students. I know there's some professors here, um, and you can go and do it yourself. You can go work for someone or you can go to a place that um, has great leverage. And I saw, I was attracted to the platform of SOM, um, tremendous history there, to see if I could harness the power of the platform and take it somewhere else. Um, it seemed like a crazy notion, you know, 25 years ago, but uh, it certainly became possible. And not to encourage any of you to, um, to do that or to follow in my footsteps, but just to imagine that anything is possible and to believe it um, and always look for opportunity. So anyway, um, not to focus too much on SOM, but it's sort of known for large things and some significant things back in its classic period. But it also had some poetic people along the way. This project is by Myron Goldsmith, who was one of the great architectural structural poets that practiced in America. He was a partner at SOM for many years, but he never became a sort of powerful figure within the firm. But he's become a powerful thinker um, as histories looked at his career retrospectively. This man in the early 50s 
his master's thesis um, foreshadowed the first exoskeleton um, clear span center core high rise. And this is um, of note in the Ablos Herreras book on uh, the office tower. He also did these quiet poetic works, um, the Kitt Peak Telescope in Arizona, the Rocky Chucky Bridge, all post-tensioned, fantastic project never built in California. The Republic newspaper plant, Francesco Del Co, the editor from Electa said this is one of his favorite buildings in America. Elegant, beautiful, self-confident project. And then the Beinecke Library at Yale, just um, a wonderful, warm, unbelievable, spiritual place to be in, repository for rare books. So there's a sort of undercurrent within the firm of smaller projects, experimental projects, and the firm has always supported somehow experimentation. I'm not sure how that worked. So lots of big things, lots of powerful people, Bruce Graham, Gordon Bunshaft, Nat Owings, but also quiet, poetic sort of practitioners that they allowed to exist within the firm. And I think it's a sign of health. It's a, a sign to the world that they're not afraid to sort of internally critique themselves. Goldsmith, I believe, was kept around by Bruce Graham because he was a man full of ideas. And I think buildings like Hancock and Sears were greatly influenced by this practitioner of smaller projects. So there is a place for lots of different things in a platform like SOM. And I think this is some of the evidence um, of that kind of um, activity. In 1950, uh, MoMA had an exhibition curated by Philip Johnson. Um, this was the first time that MoMA celebrated a sort of group practice um, as opposed to a singular architectural practitioners. And I think this is symbolic of where I stand in terms of a philosophy about architecture. Our group that was mentioned earlier, the Education Lab, has many, many talented GSD graduates. Um, four of note, Scott Duncan, John Ciccone, uh, Colin Coop, um, and Adam Semmel. Fantastic talents and um, people who are, you'll hear about um, in the future. But anyway, we come together and we collaborate um, and whatever idea um, comes forward as the best idea is the idea we go with. So the subject of authorship is not really so present. It's about uh, achieving the right solution. And I think that goes back all the way to the 50s um, as a sort of uh, tenant of, um, of the firm. The other thing the firm has done um, is they have always, since the 40s, incorporated art serious art into projects. So on the upper right is a hotel we did in Cincinnati back in 1946. And this is the first example of serious art being placed in a corporate environment in a very appropriate way. Joan Ackman recently wrote an article about this that was featured in one of the journals. Subsequently, many um, collaborations happened with well-known artists, um, Miro, Picasso, uh, many projects with Noguchi, and I've sort of continued that strain of collaboration with different artists, and I'll show you some of those in some of our projects. But again, it's part of the philosophy uh, that the firm has always supported. Our particular group has established a unique ethos, um, and that ethos is essentially um, not to have an aesthetic fingerprint or imprint that we use from project to project. We consider each project on its own terms uh, from the point of view of a, a clean slate. We look at all the given parameters. We establish a way to prioritize those parameters. So client aspirations, 
um, place, imagining what the place can be, the narratives of history of that place, the uh, existing investments of that place, and we seek to leverage all of those investments and co-join them together if we can with um, this new set of parameters. So as um, the bottom there are diagrams of um, there's sort of emblems of all the different projects we've done in our studio. There are many more. But you can see that they're all uniquely formed and have unique aesthetics and unique design languages. So we have a belief system. We have a philosophy. We don't have an aesthetic that we imprint from project to project. There are not many architects that operate that way. In fact, many notable architects, you can predict sort of what their next project might look like because they have an aesthetic that they share from project to project. However, in the art world, this is sort of an old idea, and it's been around pretty much since the turn of the century. The Dada started it. Um, Picabia maybe was the first, who knows. Um, came to America with Duchamp and people like that. Um, and these artistic practitioners have a philosophy, um, but they have many different design languages and different parameters um, that manifest their particular belief in art. One contemporary artist that, um, that does that, that we've been following and attempting to work with, is Pierre Huig. Um, on the left is, well, he, he deals with narratives, um, and he sets parameters based on those narratives, narratives about the myth of a place, or the allure of a place, or the history of a place, and he sort of combines them in his own unique way um, to produce his works of art. On the left is a project I saw in Madrid, and that project in an orangerie in the Retiro Park has these plants organized in the circular planter. And these plants are plants that are used by different countries in the form of celebrations for their particular countries. And he stitched together the narrative of the original show that happened in this particular orangerie where they celebrated the plants from the Philippines. Um, and so he, you know, you can see how he sort of uh, tied together history and things like that. On the right is um, a play, a maquette, sort of puppets he did at the Carpenter Center, where he had, he was in discussion with uh, Corbusier, um, talking about the challenges Corb had with the commission of the Carpenter Center, and um, discussing the contemporary art scene but also the problems of doing an art project in a university setting where it's inherently sort of quasi-bureaucratic. Anyway, the sort of narrative of challenge, the narrative of history, and all those sorts of things, but very different aesthetic manifestations of this kind of work. True, too, of um, a gentleman who's currently on exhibit at the DIA in Beacon, I would encourage you all to go see it. It's a um, very unusual show. Uh, Frenchman Jean-Luc Moulin. And he essentially deals with the philosophy, the parameters of s structures of knowledge. Um, and he creates sculptures based on different sets of parameters um, with that underlying uh, investigation of the structures of knowledge. The piece on the right is um, a set of parameters where uh, that sculpture is a result of the space of a particular knots that he was um, interested in. But very unusual um, sculptures that um, don't really look like each other, but have a, a kind of common philosophy about them. One of our Early projects in the studio, the education lab was a project in Greenwich, uh, Greenwich Academy. 
commissioned to do a, a girls' school there. And we thought the last thing they needed was another building. They had lots of buildings that were not so nice, cobbled together. And so we proposed a landscape building, a sort of heart to the campus, where the school was actually between the athletic topography, which is in the lower part of the campus, and the academic part, which is high. And the school exists between those two topographies. You actually walk out on this lawn to look at the athletic events, et cetera, or to get into the academic building. The school was terrified of the solution. It ties all their other buildings together internally, but in the end, they quite love it. But it was a kind of big risk early on um, for the studio. It's wooden timbered, and we got the then director of DIA, Michael Govan, to help us raise money to incorporate the art of James Terrell in this project. The school didn't even know what art was, really. Um, and we accomplished it um, with help from friends. And Michael since moved on to LACMA out in Los Angeles. The next project was our first public school, the first public school the firm has ever done. The budget was $170 a square foot, incredibly lean, hugely risky. Uh, the contracts in Connecticut are very onerous. Um, and a greenfield site in a um, suburban neighborhood. We actually designed this building as an interesting manipulation of um, school typologies, which I'll show you in a minute. But these um, pockets, um, these holes in the building were actually built around existing tree stands on the site uh, to sort of center the building so that it had the most landscape around it to shield it from the neighbors. We, this is about the subject of creativity. We wrote into our specifications penalties for the contractor if they touched certain trees, significant penalties, so they couldn't really they had to build around these trees on the site. So on the left, the little green diagram is a typical school typology, double loaded corridor with assembly spaces at the end. And our take on this was to split apart the classrooms and put the assembly functions in the middle with atria. And so there actually is no, or there are no hallways in this project. You always walk between these pockets of nature. <clears throat> the next project in this sequence was um, at Deerfield Academy, a science building. Uh, at that time, it was our largest project. It's 80,000 square feet, three levels for various sciences. And it's um, a series of landscape walls that mediate different topographies. Quite a challenging building. It was the first private, or sorry, uh, K through 12 building that achieved the gold lead standard at that time. It's about processions, and we collaborated with James Terrell on this, and an observational astronomer. Um, and all of the public space lighting in this project is the art lighting. There is no other lighting, so quite a feat, quite a challenge, and um, you know, difficult project to pull off. Next was uh, St. Albans, Colin uh, Coop, who's a graduate here, worked on this with me, and John Ciccone also. Um, really beautiful project. It's on the, um, the close in uh, Washington, D.C., which is the environment that Olmsted designed for the National Cathedral. It's a national landmark green space. The building on the upper left is from 1907. It's the original building of the school. And the red brick building on the bottom is 60 feet down a hill and done in the 30s. And our new building sort of mediates between 60 feet of topographic change. We imagined it kind of like a treehouse that connected five buildings together. Um, anyway, we have a two staircases in the project in this treehouse. One staircase is an internal connection through all the levels from zero to minus 60 feet. And there's a second staircase that's external. 
for the pilgrims going up to the cathedral so they can walk through the building without going into the building. So if we go back, these staircases connect at every level to the inside, or you can continue on the outside and process almost like a hill town up to the cathedral, um, which is in the background there. <clears throat> it has nine um, serious levels of landscape, and each level, um, when the trees fill in, will support mature tree growth. So all the tree pits are at least five feet deep, um, and it'll look quite fantastic in a few more years. We were very careful about um, certain details about helping the building blend in. You'll notice that many of our buildings are not about um, object considerations. Um, they uh, seek to respond and be sensitive to things around them. We were very careful in selecting the stone and the grain of the stone. In this image, you can see at the bottom we have heavier stone that relates to existing buildings um, with particular coloration, grayer, darker coloration, and on the top, a much finer grain that relates to other buildings that exist on, on the campus. We competed uh, four years ago in a competition at the Air Force Academy. The Air Force Academy is also a national landmark site in Colorado Springs. We were fortunate enough to win this competition and um, it's for the second symbolic piece on the campus. So the first one is obviously the chapel at the Air Force Academy, which is a religious, a kind of spiritual symbol. This is meant to be a secular symbol and it's proximate to the chapel, which is just to the left of this image. The campus itself is fantastic. It's um, hundreds and hundreds of acres um, in the southern ramparts of the Rockies is the backdrop. And it's a very organized, disciplined campus with three essential topographies. You can see on the, on the right-hand bottom slide there, there's a service level at the bottom. The next level up with the sort of port cochere is the cadet level, which is secure. And then the level above that is the public level. So it's very, it's sectionally incre incredibly clear and very clever. And the only piece that stands out in this, uh, aside from the Rocky Mountains in the background, is the chapel that Walter Netsch designed when he was 26 years old for SOM. So again, young people have great opportunity there. <clears throat> this is our competition entry and scheme. It's a sort of luminous uh, glass structure. I'll explain the meaning of it. And you can see its proximity to the chapel. It's about 115 feet high and leans out about 66 feet. The symbol of the Air Force Academy is the North Star, the Polaris. And our scheme, that glass piece that you saw, is at the orientation of the latitude of, of Colorado Springs. That's what dictates the angle. And with that angle, that's the latitude of Colorado Springs, focused on the North Star, it's always in alignment with the Polaris, no matter how the Earth rotates. So it sort of grounds, it uses their emblem and sort of grounds this building, which is a center for character and leadership um, in a very strong and real way. So day or night, you can sit in the main conference room of this project, look up through and know that the Polaris is there. And so they're grounded there's a sort of integrity about the idea. The number one at the bottom is the wing honor conference room, they call it, where they sit and talk about subjects of um, ethics in education, and you can see the alignment with the Polaris. This is um, 
the main public entrance from the public level. The gardens are at the cadet level. And there are actually five different entrances for different constituent audiences, so a very complex kind of processional considerations for the project. Um, they took our design, something we're proud of, and they, the new patch for this particular discipline within the academy is the representation of the architecture. These are some of the renderings we did. Um, the structure is quite innovative. Um, we have in-house engineers, so we collaborate with them on everything just about. Um, and the structure is fat in the center and very thin at the edges, um, representing the sort of lateral forces, the real lateral forces of the, uh, the glass piece. All the light in here is reflected. The studio is very into light. We have done deep research um, on the subject of light. And many of these projects are harvest about 80 to 100% of light during daylight, daylight hours in many of the classroom spaces. So we're serious into that subject as well. This is the Wing Gardner Conference Room, which is all aluminum and sort of homage to the, the um, chapel, which is made out of aluminum, airplane grade aluminum. And the very particular kind of um, end of the glass tower that we worked on with uh, an observational astronomer from the academy to make sure the alignments were precise. Um, precise enough to uh, accommodate the tectonic shifts of the plates of the earth, things like that. We've been, um, we started small and humbly, and it was a great risk because partners have to generate um, profit in the firm. And many of these projects had minuscule fees, um, but we did them with very talented, lean teams. And we've been fortunate enough to progress into bigger work with bigger fees so we can have more talented people and slightly bigger teams to do these projects. And one is a significant project in, um, in Malaysia, very proximate to Singapore, a school project. And we're very, um, it, it's many buildings that, are, that have a sort of kit of parts, a structural kit of parts. Um, to produce a, not an object building, but a serial solution for the school project. It's on a old palm oil plantation in Malaysia, and the site has two significant hills about 100 feet tall. And so the organization is a series of terraces uh, with these um, school buildings on them. We're trying to um, work here with um, the discipline of a kind of framework, a lattice work um, that responds to indigenous structures of Southeast Asia. And just to give you a flavor of those, all the corridors are exterior in this project. So this is a, one of the classroom wings, um, two classrooms side by side with external corridors around that are shaded with these wooden brisoles and concrete enframements. And we have various stairs. Uh, we're very into procession. Uh, I was greatly influenced by the drawings of James Sterling, not necessarily the buildings of him. Um, probably many of you don't even know who he is, but a great thinker uh, for his time. And on the upper left are some of the indigenous buildings of, um, of Malaysia. But the buildings are very beautiful, very peaceful, um, very related to the environment that they're in. Um, well detailed. We've spent lots of time in Malaysia with contractors understanding how to detail such a thing. Very disciplined, but lyrical um, within the discipline of the um, architectural solutions. <clears throat> this building is a year from finishing. I'm really excited by it. It's in Greenwich Village. And uh, it's the University Center for New School. 
It has a um, seven-story academic piece on the corner of 14th Street and 5th Avenue. And above it is a 600-bed dormitory. We um, worked with them, collaborated with them to understand what they were looking for. And they wanted to express the energy of the university in this project. So we came up with an idea to externalize the fire stairs in this project. And so all the fire stairs are on the perimeter, and they all have clear glass to the outside. So in the end, when it's done, it'll be like a hive of activity. You'll see people pulsating up and down through the building. This is the actual construction. This is the real project on the right-hand side of there. That's the site on 14th and 1st. So it's very near half a block from Union Square on Fifth Avenue, right above Washington Park. It's a sort of vertical organization of different activity centers within this university center. And after we organized them in a, in a way that um, was appropriate for their program, we simply post-rationalized the fire stair to connect all the different social functions of the school. And then we had to figure out how to make that fire stair code compliant. And so we had many discussions with the city of New York about how to do that. So no small feat. I don't think this has ever been done before, at least not in New York. So these are the different assembly social functions stacked up in the project, including libraries up on the top. And we considered the subject of elevating very closely. There's an elevator for the dorms, which is the one on the left that goes straight up. And the elevatoring for the academic portion, if you just do it by population counts, which is how architects usually do it, we'd need 16 elevators. So a big chunk of the floor plan. We didn't want that. So we ended up with five elevators. And we organized them to have skip stops. So they have three different stops. And where they stop at particular floors during peak hours, the doors open and you see these cascade of stairs. And so intuitively, you know how to move through the building uh, from these um, elevator stops. I'm only showing you this because there are many parts of buildings to consider other, other than the form of the building or the shape of the building. There are all these sort of working parts that you have to consider. And there's creativity in considering all of these things. So this was the stair that we post-rationalized from that exercise, those parameters we set up. Th these stairs intersect all the social and assembly functions of the school. And you can see how they're sort of um, exposed to the outside with clear glass. We learned that if the stair's on the perimeter, you don't need fire glass to the outside. <clears throat> we also learned working with a clever contractor in New York, Tishman Construction, that we needed to close the top of the stair with something. And we did it in cast concrete. And if we worked with them um, in a collaborative way, we could do another stair that was exposed on top of the enclosed fire stair. And we used that to further activate the building. And that's what we're building here. So you can see the stair on top of the stair and all the things that it intersects in the, uh, the stacking of the project. So just to explain the differences, that's a normal fire stair on the top. And these things are, the rise and the run are prescribed by different codes in different jurisdictions. And this is our solution for our fire stair on the bottom. And you can see the stair on top of the stair. And what that allowed us to do is that from any of these open spaces in the plan, you can always see at least two stair locations. And you can intuitively understand how to move through the project without clever graphics and signage in the project. So this is the lobby. And on the right and on the left, you can see how you can navigate the building. Sort of up along. The stair on top of the stair has a window all along it always. 
and there's always fire glass doors into the stair below. Anyway, you get the idea, and it, it intersects everything in the project. You can even look under stairs with fire glass from floor to floor in different areas. So it sort of winds its way through and, and seeks to create this um, level of energy that they were interested in. Colin Coop and John Ciccone worked on this with me as well, GSD grads. And this is just a, a sectional model we built to explain it to the client, how it works. So the up, <coughs> upper diagrams are from the code, and it's how these stairs are either structured or laid out, um, very very prescribed, and we use those to generate the formal characteristics of the outside of the building. So these windows that um, reveal the stairs and the shingling of the brass facade are all based on the integer of the circulation system of the building. So it has a kind of integrity from inside to out. These are some of the stair drawings that we did in BIM. You know, the, I hope you guys are learning that here, but it's a very important tool now um, that architects have to use. These are the facades unfolded. So each of the three facades that face public streets have this kind of activity of the students moving up and down through the project. You can see the integer of the brass shingling is derived from the stair. And we worked with this fantastic graphic artist from Switzerland, Rudy Bauer, to do the uh, graphics that help navigate um, the project and the stairs. That's the, the green is the internal fire stair that has full glass to the outside, and the red is the stair on top of the stair that also has full glass to the outside and is open to all the spaces on the inside. These are actual construction photos. That's Fifth Avenue. This is 13th Street. The shingling's quite beautiful and gives it a texture that's, uh, we think, compatible with other of the good buildings in Greenwich Village. It's Fifth Avenue again. And the corner is beautiful. Brass is um, an alloy of copper and zinc, and it never patinas to green, so it always stays this sort of color. So it reacts to the atmosphere a bit, but it never um, changes radically. And we like that idea of um, a real material that interacts but um, doesn't have dramatic change associated with it. I think this is the last project. Um, we're really lucky now. We got a very big project to do, four million square feet um, in Mumbai. Uh, Mumbai, India in general, is um, extremely difficult to work in. Uh, hyper bureaucratic, hyper democratic place. And all of these large public projects have to be done by private clients with private money to work around the um, the strictures of the particular environments. So this four million square foot project is, is being built by a private family in Mumbai. It's over a billion dollar investment. And they get the revenues for 60 years. And then they have to turn it back over to the government. So it's quite interesting. These private families are building highways, like toll roads in India, under the same kind of um, auspices. So the plan of um, our new terminal is in red. The horseshoe shape under it is the existing terminal that has to remain operational while this is being built. 
and the brown patches are slums, hyper-dense forms of urbanism that exist inside the secure perimeter of the airport. So Slumdog Millionaire was filmed in the brown patch just to the left of the red airport diagram. So they actually cut the fence and they form these dense forms of urbanism inside the secure perimeter and the government doesn't do anything about it. Furthermore, there are two blue rivers that go through. You can see them on the right side and they're sort of canals. They have uh, concrete embankments and the pirates from the slums use them to sort of uh, as, as escape routes when they're moving around and we have to reroute one of them. So complexities that um, you know, are, are very challenging because we're displacing parts of the slum and we have to provide housing for them to move them off site. At the same time, we're trying to reroute, you know, one of the waterways that they use for, you know, purposes that you don't want to know about. Anyway, here's our scheme. Uh, it has a landscaped roof and a, and a head house that's all about light and about the Indian culture. We, were, we collaborated with um, uh, two very famous uh, fashion designers in Mumbai because we didn't understand the complexity of the culture. Their names are Abu and Sandeep. They're amazingly talented people. This is our solution for the headhouse, sort of um, this um, concrete construction, computer-generated. Scott Duncan worked on this with me, another GSD graduate. Um, it's about um, bringing light into the terminal day or night. The construction, the roof plan, the roof of just the headhouse is 17 acres large. Um, there's some of the stats there. It has 8,500 openings in it for light and 28 large skylights and 240 smaller skylights that feed the 8,500 um, light apertures in the project. We used um, the color shift from cyan to blue to yellow in the form of dichroic glass which approximate the sort of um, feather colors of a peacock, which is a very important symbol in their culture um, as the sort of um, cast of light that appears inside the project. This is just a detail of how the, um, the skylights are working and the, the dimension of them, quite large, you can see. Um, we are able to turn off the lights 100% 80% of the time uh, during daylight hours. So again, the subject of light is something we consider strongly in the studio. This is one of the models we used to communicate the idea to the client. This is the construction of the head house piece. And these, the integrity of this, um, this idea goes from the top all the way down to the claim hall, which is the bottom of the right hand drawing there. Some of the cultural references that the fashion designers helped us with were on the left, Fatipur Sikri, which is a Mughal temple from around the 1500s, uh, north of Mumbai. In the center is one of the domes from the Taj Mahal, and on the right is the peacock. So those are the primary cultural references we used. Dichroic glass is very interesting. It, it transmits one color and reflects another, um, and these are the the colors we use to um, be appropriate to their culture um, in the project. Very expensive and um, challenging to use. This is how we deployed it around the column capitals in the different colors. So there are circles of dichroic glass within these peacock-shaped eye forms of the skylights. This is one of the renderings we did um, to communicate these ideas to the client. And these are the actual construction photographs. We used a company um, in Canada, that's who we wanted to work with, but they were too expensive. And so they opened a plant in Mexico to make these pieces based on our computer 
our computer drawings um, to make it cost effective to ship to India. It was cheaper than actually making it in India and a better quality. So after you think about these ideas, the lesson is you have to go find out how to make it. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. This is looking from the claim hall where you collect your bags all the way up back through to the departures hall above. The spans are 64 meter spans, structural spans. The dichroic glass isn't installed yet. <clears throat> anyway, the, those are projects we're working on in my studio. Um, with various talented people um, offering their ideas and help to make those things happen. I also started an initiative in 2000 inside the firm to create the SOM Journal where we invite external critics in to crit critique the internal workings of the firm. A very, um, at the time, dangerous thing to do because we printed the naked transcripts of the jury proceedings. But this has been a vehicle to elevate quality across the scale of the firm. So we're doing our little projects in our little studio, trying to do them well. And we're also elevating the design gifts course in the firm to raise the level of all the production in the firm at a different scale across 1,200 people. And it's working, we're now working on Journal 9, and it's been an important vehicle um, that's caused a kind of internal competition inside the different offices. This is just a quote from Fred Bernstein, who wrote about this in the New York Times. You could read it, you know, makes other firm monographs seem like high school yearbooks or something like that. <clears throat> and that's, um, that's what we have. We have other exciting projects and hopefully you'll all come to visit. You're all welcome. Um, certainly uh, anyone can apply to work there as well. Um, we're doing lots of exciting things. There are other exciting studios there as well. Um, and if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Brass. I was, I'm not used to this. I wanted to know what was the thinking in getting to the brass shingles? Uh, Interesting, good question. Um, just north of this site is a landmark district. New York has many landmark districts. Just north is a landmark district called Ladies Mile. And it's, um, for the most part, um, there was a kind of shopping district, so they had department stores, Gimbel's and Macy's and um, Lord and & Taylor and things like that. And a lot of them were sort of cast iron constructions. And that's, so based on the use of that kind of shopping district and the tectonic of cast iron construction, they landmarked that district in New York. And just to the south of our site was another separate landmark district the Greenwich Village Historic District, which is a lower scale um, construction, townhouses beautifully done out of brick, and some classic pre-war buildings, et cetera. But both districts had a sort of integrity about them. They were done with real materials, with real tectonics. And so we thought it would be appropriate. And our site was sort of in a gap between these two historic districts. So it didn't have to respond to one or the other necessarily. But we thought it was appropriate if the material we used um, had a, a sort of um, integrity about it, a real quality about it, so that it could um, 
interact with the atmosphere, but in a way that would soften it as opposed to dra radically changing it. Like in Greenwich Village, the, the townhouses there that are done in red brick, with age, the brick has sort of softened, um, and the buildings aren't crisp anymore. They have this sort of softness about them. And so we were after that kind of quality, um, and we researched this material, and we found a building in Berlin that had been up for 10 years, so we actually went to see it two summers ago to see how it looked after 10 years, and then we called the architect and understood what the alloys were and um, all of that, so, yeah. We, um, this is an important thing. We, we always push to get really good people to do the, construct the curtain walls. Um, Europeans are coming here and they're much better at this than the American curtain wall firms. Unfortunately, on this project, we didn't get one of those and we're working with a firm in Florida called Gamma. Um, so it's, I think in the end they did a nice job, but it um, takes an extreme amount of effort to get to that place. Um, you know, lots of visits, lots of mock-ups, um, yeah, thank you. You mentioned that the peacock is the cultural symbol of India, and from that you derive the, as I understand it, the basic visual vernacular. And uh, I just, I my, so my question is, what would you consider the American cultural vernacular to be, as per, from S O M's point of view, perhaps maybe in the. Uh, the uh, Trade Center in New York, or whatever. Do you understand the uh, yeah. question? First off, um, the peacock is a symbol in India, and it's a symbol of joy and love and good things, you know, make people feel good and um, sign of luck, that sort of thing. And, and it wasn't really our understanding of this, but we were guided to it by the Abu and Sandeep, the fashion designers who helped us understand appropriate cultural references. India is a, an amalgamation of very complex cultures, the Mughal culture, Hindu, Buddha, you know, just a collision of everything, and they include everything. So how to navigate that in different parts of India is something we needed help with, and we recognized that. So we weren't there to impose something. We wanted to understand what, that, what an appropriate design language might be. But in America, it's, it's interesting. You know, um, I think, I mean, if I were to take a, a leap here, and I'm sure I'll be in trouble when I do this, but it's about, you know, bigness and boldness and looking to the beyond and imagining that anything's possible. Sort of like the Hudson River School painters, um, like um, landscapes that were so big you couldn't imagine, or sunsets that are so beautiful um, that, you know, just um, made you want to be bigger and better and strive for more. And I think the firm is emblematic of that, like many successful companies in America where they took risks and they were started by humble working class people. Owings and Skidmore were depression era kids and they were hungry and creative and opportunistic and they created this and I'm the same and all the partners are the same. You know, working class, hungry, humble, ambitious and you know, that's what America is about. So again, anything's possible. All you have to do is imagine it and go do it. Um, first of all, thanks for the interesting projects and the great talk. Um, so I wanted to ask, the sort of earlier and, and smaller projects clearly have this ethos of, of, um, of response and contextualism <coughs> that sort of is their core. So 
I guess my question is when you move on to projects that are such a scale where that's no longer possible, uh, of which I think we saw a few, how do you think that ethos has changed in guiding your studio's work, you know, <coughs> or, or something else replaced it? How do you, how do you navigate that, that shift in scale? I think the m manifestations of each are unique, and <coughs> that's an important part of our ethos, that the aesthetic is unique, um, and the parameters are different for each project, and how you prioritize those parameters are different for each project. So I would respectfully disagree that there's not a consistent strain from big to small in these projects. Um, and each one is trying to respond to a set of conditions in a, in a unique way, like the artists um, that we mentioned. Um, to reinforce that point, and maybe to be more clear about it, Michael Heiser is a great American artist, and he has a quote, I'm going to paraphrase because I can't remember it exactly, but when he goes to a site, he seeks to expose the potential of that place as opposed to imposing something on it. And I think that that's really um, what we try to do. Maybe your reading is that some of the larger ones are less successful than the smaller ones, and it, and it may be because it's a huge scale shift for us. Um, and you can't always control things that are 15 hours away on a plane um, with very complicated um, contractual relationships, you know, with, with these very big projects. But we're doing our best, and maybe we'll get better at it if we get more of them. So. Sorry, I didn't mean to imply. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> I just meant we're not thin-skinned. So. Just that it, it seems that you know the avenues that you can pull those parameters together are so different because of the, the change in scale. So I guess my question was more about how you how you navigate the different parameters. Yeah, I, I've I've discovered. I mean, everyone has their own um, what they're good at and what maybe what they're not good at. And along the way in my career, I've understood kind of what I'm good at. I'm good at under understanding who's talented and who's not and you know what a good idea is and what good idea isn't um, not necessarily the most facile person but you know creativity has many different forms it takes um, I also discovered along the way that I'm better at things that I can imagine in my mind first as opposed to um, things that um, you know, you can't sort of understand, uh, like, um, as defined by something like gestalt, you know, where you can't sort of imagine how it all might come together. So scale is something I s struggle with. I mean, it is something that is challenging. Many of these big projects, like an airport that's four million square feet, is really a set of connected interiors, more than it is an object work of architecture, and your mind can't really understand it looking at it. So, if, for instance, if you drive up to something like the Hong Kong airport from the curbside, you see a bit of the overhang of the roof, but you can't really understand the whole thing the way that it's photographed from the air. And when you're in it, you understand, you know, this sort of um, ubiquitous roof form that goes through, but you can't really experience all the spaces in such a vast building. So, you know, I'm not sure if the idea of Gestalt is kind of uh, outdated and if there's some new kind of um, visual understanding that we need with these big projects. Because more and more um, projects are interconnected. It's like a connected set of interiors. For instance, in Hong Kong, just, you know, you could. Um, check your bag down now downtown, get your boarding pass, take a train out, you know, go through security, shop in a separate building, take another train out to your gate without really ever, ever experiencing iconic architecture. Well, what does that mean for iconic architecture, the kind of airport type? I don't know. But there are lots of these complexities that um, are present in the world, and I'm not sure anyone's really 
dealing with them super effectively. Like they're seductive pieces of architecture, but the future is really a more connected kind of um, solution that leverages lots of different things that are not necessarily architecture. It's interesting to think about, but a good question. Hopefully you can figure it out. I have a very practical question about the Education Lab. I, I think the presentation and the projects proved very clearly how something like this introduces experimentation and innovation within the school projects. And there's a lot of interesting uh, sort of isolated elements that you take and flesh out in a manner that suggests that you're working almost in a subsidized environment. But you just told us that every studio has to make ends meet and be profitable. <coughs> So how is it, on a very practical basis, how is it that you can do that kind of work <coughs> with public schools, be profitable, and also be affordable to them? So um, it's no secret, but in the, I was telling you earlier, um, in 89, the, sorry, 87, the stock market crashed. In 89, it put great stress on our firm and, uh, so all the way through to when I was promoted in 97, the firm was under great financial stress for various reasons that we don't have now. And as a consequence, um, many of the partners left because they were fearful. And that created opportunities for people like me to come in um, and try to rework this platform and make it, um, make it more successful. But from 97, for the next, I don't know when, eight years or so, um, almost every partner, me I was sort of a, at the low, low end of the partnership, and all the meetings were about money. And that was really the catalyst for the journal where we need to talk about something else. And so, you know, you had to make money or you were gone. You know, so very practically, that's a fact of life, and that's true if you open your own firm or do anything. You know, um, but at the same time, you know, there are other things of value, like design, and what does SOM stand for, and those things. So, bringing that forward also created a kind of value that people began to recognize. So, it's not all, you know, necessarily about an exchange of currency. It's, you know, value has many forms. And over time, I think the firm has recognized that. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, uh, my question is a bit, it's twofold. Uh, first thing is that um, in terms of practicality, uh, where does the role of practicality come into play in terms of your overall design process, i.e. when you're looking at the airport design? Uh, you know, what type of operational experts are you dealing with in order to make sure that, you know, the structure itself is commercially viable? And then the second point is that even when you start the design process, do you think about the practicality? To, to what extent do you think about the practicality, let's say? Yeah. Do you let it influence your design process <laughs> in the beginning, or is it, you know? There's a, um, I think he gave this lecture at Harvard in the 40s, Stravinsky, uh, is the Norton series, right? Yeah. yeah, Elliot Norton, I think it was 46, but um, there's a quote, he, uh, the lectures are reprinted called The Poetics of Music, and Stravinsky says that um, the more you limit yourself, the more you're free. Another paraphrase quote, I can't remember it exactly. But that's how we approach our problems. They're always approached from a pragmatic point of view. These are serious people with serious um, amounts of risk that they're taking on. And these projects have to um, solve particular pragmatic concerns. For instance, on an airport, once you lay out the airplane parking spaces and you lay out the roads in the front, the residual space between those two functional layouts is what the airport terminal space is, period, end of story. And that's dictated by experts. So after you do that, then you have to figure out how to make something exciting and alluring 
um, out of that. So, you know, we have, everyone has, and in your working careers you'll have these experiences, but, you know, they're very real, challenging problems that you have to apply great creativity to. And in the end, if you're lucky, you then get to make architecture in addition to all that. I think the gentleman here says a question first. <clears throat> Could you explain a little bit more <clears throat> about the relationship of your studio to the to the firm at large and how it might <coughs> impact the thinking on large projects such as uh, the World Trade Center? Um, lots of two second question about that. So. Um, Yeah, we have different design partners and we sort of do our own thing under the umbrella of SOM and we all contribute to the firm at large. So I would say these small projects have influence in the firm because many of them get published and some of the big things do and some don't. So it, it fosters a kind of... Um, competitiveness within the firm, as does the journal, because many of the awards, as juried by outside critics, people that have gravitas in the world, have also been some of these small projects and not so many big projects. So it's pressurized um, the offerings of scale within the firm. And it's probably no secret that that's where the firm makes most of their money. So. But I think it's a healthy kind of pressurization that's, um, that's happening as a consequence. So I'm not going to take full credit for any of that, but there's that kind of dynamic within the firm uh, that's working. Um, the Trade Center project was um, designed by David Childs. And, you know, I'm sure people think about it in different ways, but I... I think in the end it's sort of um, so sort of archetypal, simple, without much relief or um, style to it that um, almost like an obelisk, like the Washington Monument. I didn't really work on it, so just my own personal thoughts on it. That it allows people sort of normal people from all over America that want to come there. We work downtown on Wall Street, and it is, I can't even walk outside of our building at lunchtime. There's so many tourists that come down there now. It's like the biggest tourist attraction in, in New York City to go there. And America can sort of look, look at it, and um, it's kind of a symbol. It, it's sort of transcended architecture, in my opinion, and is a symbol to many people. So architects may not think it's a great design, but I think, you know, it's appealing to a different, a different kind of audience. And I don't think, I think that's sort of what it was intended about. If you know David, he doesn't, this is kind of how he thinks. He doesn't really, he's not out to please a handful of architects. He's, he has a much broader, um, he embraces a much broader context of America than that. Interesting guy. I mean, he, he really was mentored by Nada Owings, who had that kind of view of America. Um, Owings, for instance, was instrumental in saving Big Sur as being a, a park. Otherwise, it would have been developed and highways would have gone through it. So that kind of, um, that kind of thinking, yeah. So I think there's maybe one more question. Yeah. Hi. So my question is about the airport plane. Plane. Uh, when you look at the uh, at the project, there are many questions involved, like American firm and Amer American culture going to Indian money and Indian culture building something. And my question is specifically about the plan, like. And it's, when you look at the plan, you have these slums, which are represented as a yellow, brownish color. And I was you know, delighted by the project afterwards, and then I was 
coming back to the first plan. So what is it going to be after? Uh, is, are the slums uh, going to be totally displaced? Uh, are they staying? How is it going to work? <coughs> um, thank you for asking that. They, I don't know eventually what's going to happen, but I can say they're going to be um, modified slightly by the requirements of the airport. So understand that these are people who have appropriated uh, land that wasn't given to them and like cut down secure fences to move in. But these are also good people that go to work every day and dress up and, you know, they're like real families. It's very interesting. It's not like homeless people are there. They're um, contributing to society over there. Um, so we were, I was quite struck by this and quite taken by it. And uh, I had a friend of mine, Robert Polidori, who's a photographer of note, go over there and actually photographically document these slums. Um, and so we've done that and we've mapped them all. He's done these beautiful photographs of everything so we can, as a, you know, a residue of history, we can say, you know, this is what it was before we were here. And we're not modifying it much, but um, enough that it won't be exactly as it is. But it wouldn't be static anyway. I mean, it's always changing because they're kind of provisional structures. They're tarps and sheets of metal that they appropriate from highway. You know, they're provisional kind of structures, but inventive in their own way. Anyway, if you've never been to one, I'd encourage you to see it quite Actually, I don't know them in Mumbai, but I work with slum upgrading in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yeah, there are many of favelas here in, in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. But still, uh, uh, the question was more about, like, are you using the land for something else, or are they staying and modifying themselves, like, without any intervention of your design? Um, modifying it slightly for requirements of the project, so. Thank you. Thank you all, and good luck.